Christ has a fold of sheep, and they are his children whom he has called unto himself. Since that very first call Christ gave us, we have been trained to and do recognize his voice, and so we follow him. We do not follow the voice of another because we have become familiar with the voice of our shepherd. John 10, verse 4 through 5. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. We have been, become accustomed to the voice in the way of our shepherd. Our shepherd is like no other. Here is what our shepherd is like. John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Psalm 23, verses 2 through 3. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Our shepherd knows exactly what his sheep needs, and he knows exactly how to lead his flock. We know the voice of our shepherd because when he speaks, we can hear that he has care in leading his sheep. There are voices out there that call you to follow, but they are not at all like the voice of our shepherd. Those voices come from hirelings. John 10 verse 12, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. Beware of these hirelings. They may say that they are with the shepherd and here to help you, but here is the truth about hirelings. John 10, verse 13. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Hirelings do not care for your life nor your safety. The shepherd, however, does care and he gives you everlasting life. The hireling's destination for you is destruction. Whereas the shepherd is leading us to God, our Father, and glory, so that we may live with him for eternity. Which voice will you heed to? That of the hireling or the voice of the shepherd? John 10, verse 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I wanted, before I begin, just to commend the brethren for your singing. Our singing has been picking up. I've noticed that. You know, when Israel would worship God, the surrounding people would hear it. And they said, it sounds like there's a shout of a king among them. Because the king is the confidence of the people. And so maybe why our singing is improving is because we're becoming more aware of the king. Maybe that's what's going on here. And that would be akin to what the shepherd is doing, which is giving us eternal life. And that is to know God and to know his son. Amen. Eternal life is a delightful thing, brother. And our shepherd is a good shepherd. I'll tell you, I, I love the shepherd. I love the shepherd. He's a good shepherd. We've been subject to other kinds of shepherd in our life, but Jesus is a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's about as far as I'm going to get tonight, okay? Now, this series is about the person and work of Christ Jesus. I especially wanted to accentuate, as I go through all of these different sermons, is that Jesus is unique with regard to who he is and with regard to what he does, okay? There is nobody who is like Jesus. I know that the saints of God are being made like him, Obviously, and that's the result of the great work of God. But there are things that Jesus is and does that we are not. <laughs> and one of those things is conferring life. The Gospel of John, a main theme of the Gospel of John is the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. That is, he is in fact a man that is divine. And so that's how he begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One of the peculiarities of divinity is the conferment of life. The best that any man can do in the world is to seek to emulate life. That is, to teach by the precepts of men, to try to live before God. But only God can give life. Only he can do that. 
And that is what the message of the Gospel of John is all about. Jesus told the Jews, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You think you have life because of an academic retention of the Bible that you can recall and regurgitate what the scripture says, and you think that that is life. But you have actually missed the whole point. For they are they which testify of me. I think, brethren, this is, a, this is actually a great consolation to me. Because we are in step tonight with the harmony and focus of the scriptures, which is the person of Jesus. And when you're, in, when you're in step with the focus of the scriptures, now you're ready for God to undergird what you're doing and what you're saying, right. see. Right. Jesus is the one who gives life. He dispenses it and he sustains it. And he's the only one that can do this. John chapter 5 and verse 21 and 22. As the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. Jesus gives life to whoever he wants to. Amen. That's how it is. God has entrusted that entirely to the Son. It's entirely the prerogative of Jesus to give life. If you have life, it's because Jesus wanted you to have it and because Jesus gave it to you. I'll tell you, that right there is very edifying. And so when John comes to the end of the Gospel of John, he tells you what the objective of the writing of the book is. He says, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And if it can ever get through to people that Jesus gives the life, then they'll start trying to emulate the life and start going to the life giver. And if they go to him, he'll give them life. That's how marvelous our Savior is. And I think this is something that we continually have to be thinking about in my mind. We have to continually affirm this. Jesus gives life. Jesus gives life because this is a great, this is a great tactic of the enemy to try and draw you away from Christ and put your confidence in something else. And so then the best that you can do is emulate the life. But that is a very dangerous place to be. If you've ever tried, if you've ever tried plastic fruit, not that I'm saying you have, but God doesn't like plastic fruit. He wants the real deal that comes from Jesus. And Jesus will make you fruitful. Now, eternal life is to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The new covenant is a covenant of nearness. It's a covenant of knowledge. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 11, he says, They shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. It is a covenant of personal intimacy that takes place between Christ and his people, or from the perspective of our text, between the shepherd and his sheep. It is one of the strange things in our day that so many professing believers seem to be distant and alienated from God. You certainly, you've noticed this when you've heard preaching in our day. There, I'm not saying it's all this way. Obviously, I can't say that because I've not heard all preaching, and so that would be foolish for me to say something like that. But in some of the things I've heard, you get the sense when you're listening to it that at least it's like the preacher thinks the people are living in a distant relationship from him. See? It's a, it's a strange kind of thing, but it's happening in our day. It's a, but it's so contrary to what the new covenant is, and it's so contrary to what the giving of eternal life is. We've talked about this, and this, is, this has been one of the things. I don't want to make this a soapbox, but, but since it is a... a very contemporary trend in worship. To think that worship is, is like a portal by which we are drawn into the presence of God. And when I hear people say this, I want to say, where have you been all week? Because yeah. Yeah. That, sounds, that sounds a little too much like Old Covenant yeah. than like New Covenant. Mm -hmm. See, praise is not a source. Uh, allow, me, allow me this little diversion. I'll come right back. But praise isn't like a praise isn't a source to get into the presence of God. 
Praise is a happy result of having been in the presence of God. And if you haven't been in the presence of God all week long, then more than likely, when you praise, it's going to be flat. It's going to be pretentious. Because I, I think, brethren, I think if people are having a, if, if people aren't praising God, and you've been in services like this when you were like the only one singing out, I think if those people will really get into the presence of God and stay there, won't be long, they'll be praising. Amen. Because this is what eternal life is, and I say that because when you look at our text, you do not get the idea that the sheep are living distant from Christ. Amen. You get the whole opposite picture altogether. Yeah. Uh -huh. My sheep know, hear my voice. They hear my voice. And I know them. Yeah. And it's in that context that, and I give unto them eternal life. Yeah. And they shall never perish. Right. Now I love to be close to Jesus. And I know you do too. I'm my best when I'm near him. Amen. And I love it when godly people will stand up and just declare what God has done in salvation and not talk to me as if I'm living in alienation from Jesus. Amen. Maybe if someone is, maybe this is the very thing that'll help them get back. Yeah. Because when a sheep is when a sheep is lost, this is abnormal. Yeah. This is a, this is an abnormal. This is something's not right here. Uh -huh. This is not normal. We should never get used, brethren. If you if your assessment of people is right and they're really living in a distance from Jesus, we should never get used to that idea. Because it is so contrary to what eternal life is. And so, anyways, let's, let's get right into this. One of the distinguishing aptitudes of Christ's sheep, and this is an aptitude, an ability, is that they hear the voice of the shepherd. I say distinguishing, brethren, because we're living in a very perilous time. One of the perils of our time is hypocrisy. Men that are not lovers of God, but are rather lovers of pleasure. And one of the marks of false brethren is that they don't love the words of Jesus. Brethren, we're living in a time where there's not only a famine of the word of God, there's a famine of the hearing of the word of God. And one of the ways that that becomes obvious is that people are very indifferent when the words of Jesus are being spoken. Something isn't right there. It isn't right, but we're living in a time like that. But now, the word that we're looking at is like Jesus coming through and just like cutting through this kind of a pretentious thing. And he says, but my sheep hear my voice. Yes. If you remember the context there in which he's talking, he's talking to Jews that weren't hearing his voice. He says, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep, but my sheep hear my voice. Amen. So this is a marvelously distinguishing thing. It's like we're having to do, brethren, the work of Ezekiel. When God was working through Ezekiel, there was hypocrisy among Israel in that day. And so in Ezekiel 34, 22, it's written, Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. That's what this kind of a text does. It judges between cattle and cattle because, brethren, there are sheep, and then there are sheep. There are sheep that won't hear Jesus, and they're not his sheep. But my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. Now, there could be no better authority on the subject than the shepherd. This isn't me telling you. His sheep hears. This is Jesus, the shepherd, telling you about his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. Did you notice that everything that Jesus says in John 10 about the sheep is good? So let's just rehearse this real quick. Verse 3, the sheep hear his voice. Verse 4, the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Verse 5, a stranger they will not follow but will flee from him. Verse 16, all this is red letter. They shall hear my voice. It's all good. Every bit of that's good. Now I know, brethren, that there, I know all we like sheep have gone astray. But Jesus is talking about my sheep. And my sheep hear my voice. 
I say that because there's been a lot of bad analogies about sheep. You know how sheep are. They tend to wander. You know, The sheep, they tend to wander, and they don't listen very well. And That's not how Christ's sheep are. They hear his voice. They hear his voice. Now, I think the sheep need to have this affirmation, just as a side note. The sheep, they need to hear this because the accuser of the brethren is doing everything to get you to turn away from God, what God has done in your life and to get you to think that you haven't really been changed. That's, that's, that's his accusations. You're not really changed. You're not really. But now you've got to come back to this. You've got to come back to this. My sheep hear my voice. And just examine in your own self. Okay, that's what I'm asking you to do as I go through this first point. Is just to, because you'll know in yourself whether you're a hearer or not. Do you hear his voice? Because this is an attribute of the sheep. They hear his voice. What Jesus is actually doing here is he's boasting in his own work. Jesus is the only one that makes distinctions between people. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why are these sheep hearing? Because they've been given ears to hear. That's why they're hearing. They've been given ears to hear. In fact, we are all, these sheep are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And you know, one of those good works is this. You hear. You hear. Amen. Amen. That's a marvelous thing. You hear. See? And he goes on to say in that, and this was like a little thing I saw here yesterday. He says, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now listen, brethren, aren't you glad that God has told you beforehand what he's going to do? So that when he does it, it's like it certifies that God is the one doing this work. It's like it certifies. Now listen, let me listen to something that he said through Isaiah a long way back before this thing happened, before this great work happened. He said, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And down in the third verse, he says this. This is the result of this reign of this king, you know, the one that's been exalted sitting at the right hand. What's he doing up there? The eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge. Why is that? Because they're hearing. They'll hearken. They're going to pay attention. See, up to this point, God's people at this point weren't paying attention. But he's saying now, when I set my king on my holy hill, this is going to be one of the marks of his work in them. They are going to hearken. My sheep hear my voice. And so what I'm telling you is that if you have the ability to hear, it's because God gave you that ability to hear. Otherwise, you wouldn't hear. There are some people that God doesn't want to hear. This is just the truth. They're saying it's not our job to go out and judge who these people are, and I'm not a purveyor of doom. I'm not... I'm not saying let's go out and tell everybody God doesn't want you to hear. That's why you're not hearing right now. God doesn't want you to hear. No, nope, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there's some people that God doesn't want to hear. And so if you are hearing, it's because God wants you to hear. He's the one who gives the hearing ear. The psalmist in Psalm 94 and 9 referred to him that planted the ear. You can do that. Planted the ear. In salvation, that's what he did. He like he planted the ear. So you can hear. Job 36 and verse 10. It's amazing some of these things that Job said. Job said this. He openeth also their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. You know God could do that? He can like command that people return from iniquity. And he can cause for people to submit to discipline when he's disciplining them. You know, some people don't. They bow their back and they... They kind of stiffen their neck, and I'm not going to hear this. And that's personal. That's not in your business. God can give a man an ear so that he'll pay attention to God and listen when God's disciplining them. But my point is, he's the one who gives the ear. He gives the ear. If you got it, you can hear, he gave it to you. Isaiah 50, verse 4 and 5, He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. You know, some people have sleepy ears. They got sleepy ears. 
Here they're stuck in the assembly. They got sleepy ears. Here they are. They can't hear. They're awake. The words are going in one ear and out the other. Isn't that what men say? They go in one ear, out the other. What's happened? Sleepy ears. They got sleepy ears. They're in the assembly. They're awake. Got their eyes open, but they're actually sleeping. They're not awake. This is why Paul said, awake unto righteousness. Get those ears awake. And hear. But now Isaiah said, now he wakeneth my hearing. Brother, that's a good way of looking at it. When God's shown you something, like wakeneth your hearing. So that you hear acutely. There's hearing and there's hearing. As you know. The Lord God hath opened mine ear. And I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Hey, that's how the sheep are. They're not rebellious. They're not turning back. No, he's opened their ear and they hear. My sheep hear my voice. No man has this aptitude naturally. That's my point. No one in Adam's race has this aptitude naturally. If you have it, it's been divinely given. It's a divine aptitude. And I found that to be a source of great... That, that's edifying to know. Edifying to know. God, God wanted me to hear, I hear. If, God, if you're hearing, God wanted you to hear. God gave you that aptitude. Now think, how do they hear? You remember Jesus saying that? Beware how you hear. So oh, how do the sheep hear? How do they hear? The sheep hear attentively. They're very attentive when Jesus speaks. The sheep are not indifferent when Jesus is speaking. The sheep are not dull of hearing when Jesus speaks. Did you notice whenever Paul confronted people that were dull of hearing, like in the book of Hebrews, he dealt with this thing? That he, he treated it like it was unusual. Yeah. Something's wrong here. If you're dull, something's wrong here. Because this is not how sheep are. If professing believers are dull of hearing, something has happened. Because my sheep hear my voice. Not only are they not dull of hearing, but they uh, hear attentively. They hear like Lydia heard. Someone mentioned this this morning. This certain woman, remember when Paul got the Macedonian call and he went down to Philippi and found these women there at the shoreline and he proclaimed the truth to them and the spirit drew attention to this woman that God was working in. And here's what's said about here. This is very edifying. Thank God for listeners like this. But this encourages the preacher when you see people like this. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. She attended. What does attended mean? It means to bring to. To bring near is literally what it means, okay? But it's the idea of this. Animals do things like this, see? A sheep will do things like this. Some animals have, like, flappy ears. And so you can, like, see visually when they're trying to pay attention to something, kind of like a sheep is. When, like, a shepherd will speak, you'll see this. If you look online at that Facebook video that came out here just recently of the shepherd that, that spoke and the sheep came forth, that you'll see sheep, maybe they're grazing, they put their, their head up and their ear goes whoop. Maybe you've actually seen something like this in the assembly. Maybe you've seen sheep in the assembly do something like this. They start hearing you get the sense that they know exactly what you're talking about and they do this. What are they doing? They're bringing near. They're closing the gap between themselves and who's speaking. Why do they do that? Because they want to hear what's being said. We do this sometimes. We go like this. You want to hear, you want to hear. It's a burden to me that I've been soft-spoken all my life. Just a burden. It's a horrible thing to do that because the sheep want to hear. Why are you speaking soft? And so people have to go like this. Ooh, can't hear you very well. Speak up. That's how sheep are. That's what it means. That's exactly what Lydia did. Maybe you don't do that. I mean, I'm not looking. Everyone's going like this. Well, I guess you're not really hearing me because I'm not seeing you looking forward. If you'll go forward like this, then I'll know you're listening to me. But you do that in your heart. Why do men lean forward? Why do they close the gap? Why do they want to make sure they're hearing? Because their heart has been opened. Why do they listen? Let me tell you this. They listen because they want to listen. That's why they listen. In other words, they are attentive because the capacity in the heart to long after what God is saying has been renewed. All the sheep have that. Their heart has been opened so that their hearing is attended by a longing to hear. 
Now let me just give you what some of God's people have said. And I already know this is going to resonate in your heart because I'm in the midst of sheep. Okay, so I already know this is going to resonate in your heart. But now listen to godly people talk about the word of God. Okay, Job 23, 12. I have esteemed thy words, the words of his mouth, more than my necessary food. <laughs> Haven't you done the same thing? Yes. Haven't you missed a meal because you had to get to the meeting? Mm -hmm. Huh? Well, I'm just going to show how much I love God's word. I'm just not going to eat. Get to the assembly. I didn't eat. Everybody know? I didn't eat. No, I know it's not like that, but you love his word more than you love eating. See, eating is a very strong desire. Yes. But spiritual eating is a stronger desire. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. Psalm, Amen. Psalm 119, 1.7. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Now, I already know, brother, and if you had the opportunity tonight, I already know. If you had the opportunity tonight, someone said, if you just stay home tonight, I'll give you a million bucks. But you knew that Jesus was going to be in the assembly. And you knew he was going to be speaking. I already know where the sheep would be. They could care less for the money. Why? Because their heart has been opened. So that their hearing is attended by a longing to hear. What Jesus has to say, and they're leaning. They want to hear. They want to hear the shepherd. Well, there could be other expressions. Like, I, I love what Jeremiah said. This is so wonderful. We can all identify with this experience. Thy words were found. And thy words were found. What a way of looking at illumination. Thy words were found. And I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Because I am called by thy name. Amen. Who was he? The Lord of hosts. Huh? You remember the first time when you, when you were able to connect the word of God with your experience and realizing that you were called by his name and what that did for your heart? Well, it makes the, it makes the sheep's heart to leap for joy. When someone will stand up and declare the word of God and what God has done in salvation because they can confirm that from their experience, I'm called by his name. I'm called by his name. What a wonderful thing this is. They, the words were found. They ate them. And it was the joy and rejoicing of their heart. My sheep hear my voice. They do. They hear attentively. And I'm just going to move on from this because I'm losing, I'm losing my time here. But they hear discriminately. They hear discriminately. Now, this is something you have to count on, brethren, because I know there's a lot of false teaching out there. And I'm not saying let's all stand back and quit messing with the false teachers because, of course, as we know, the sheep will not hear the voice of a stranger. But we do have to reason with the fact that Jesus said this. My sheep will not hear the voice of a stranger, but will flee from him. Now, you know in yourself, we've talked about this thing about Victoria Osteen. Things like this. And I'm, I'm not trying to say, you know, whether she's in or out. I'm not, I'm not trying to make those kind of judgments. But what she said wasn't the voice of the shepherd talking. Because Jesus would never say something like that. But you know within yourself when you've, heard, when you've heard people say things and it was kind of strange to you and there was something in you that kind of recoiled from it. This doesn't sound right at all. God loves everybody the same. But this doesn't sound right at all. Doesn't sound right. And you kind of recoil back from that. What is that? That's your sheepiness, sheepishness coming out. That's, that's what that is. See, this is like a divine protection from God. You've got to see that. This is like a divine protection from God to, to help you. Because if you listen to false teachers, they'll take your life. That's how dangerous false teaching is. It'll take your life. But now here's what the sheep do. Whoa, that doesn't sound right at all. And so instead of the ears going forward, the ears like go back. All right, closed ear time, closed ear time. That's how sheep are. See, they hear discriminately. Like Peter heard when, when Jesus was talking about the bread of life there in John 6 and the people all left. Well, he could have encouraged Peter and all the disciples to leave too. Well, we're leaving too. We're leaving too. But Jesus said unto them, he says, will you go too? And Peter stands up like a sheep and says, Lord, where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of life. Amen. I'm not distracted by these people leaving. All these people want to leave. Let them leave. You've got the words of life. I'm not going anywhere. Amen. Amen. Hey, that's how sheep are. They don't listen when other people, they're going in another direction. Sheep go, I'm listening to your voice. 
So even in the midst of this great competition that's taking place right now, we can all be very thankful that the sheep have this kind of an aptitude to close their ear off to strange teaching. See, I'm not saying we shouldn't address false teaching, but I'm saying this is a wonderful thing that God has done. And so, so we have that. My sheep hear my voice. They hear. But now, here's something that is important to see. If my sheep are hearing my voice, that must mean that Jesus is speaking. Right? If they're hearing him speak, then he must be speaking. He must be speaking. That is also an important thing to see. Jesus is speaking. If we are not careful, brethren, if we are not very careful, we can talk about Jesus as if he's some kind of historical figure in the past that's gone and dead, like he's not active. Have you ever heard someone speak like that about Jesus? 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked the earth. I want to know where he's at now. You know, Jesus had a church like this he had to talk to. He had to say this to, okay? I am he that was dead and am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and of hell. Amen. Maybe he said that because there were some people that weren't, weren't living in the, in the reality of the fact that he's living. Yeah. He's alive. I'm alive forevermore. So it shouldn't be a stretch at all for people to realize that if he's alive, he's active, then he's speaking. He's speaking. Presently, continually speaking. Do not refuse him that is speaking. That's a dangerous thing. That's a dangerous thing to refuse him that is speaking. Man's mind's trapped on the earth. There he is in the assembly. He's refusing him that is speaking. Jesus doesn't talk about earthly things. If a man's mind is trapped by the earth, he's not hearing. Something's not right. Refusing. Do not refuse him that is speaking. Sometimes his speaking is like what Brother Nair said in time past. You've come to this mountain too long. It's time to go forward. Go forward. And then someone kind of digs their heels in. This, this is feeling a little too personal. There's too much conviction in this. Don't refuse him that is speaking. See, he is speaking. Amen. From heaven he's speaking. Yeah. I'll tell you, if he's speaking from heaven, you've got to have a divine aptitude to hear it. He is Speaking, he is. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20. You have not so learned Christ. This is said to believers just like us. These, these are believers just like us. Okay? These are people that were believers in the earth after Jesus had left. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Wherever the truth is being spoken, Jesus is speaking. And the sheep are hearing. You can take consolation in this, brethren. If you are speaking the truth in the assembly, Jesus is speaking through you. He's speaking through you. This is exactly what Paul said to the Corinthians. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you where it is not weak, but is mighty in you. You want to know what makes, the, what makes powerful preaching? It's Christ speaking through the preacher. That's how it becomes mighty in you, is because Christ is speaking through you. But the point is, Christ is speaking. He is speaking, okay? Jesus is a teaching shepherd. He leads us by teaching, okay? In fact, he was known when he was in the earth as rabbi constantly called rabbi master remember what someone referred to this this morning when nicodemus came by night he said rabbi we know that thou art a teacher sent from god that's how he was known in jewry as a teacher in fact when when his eyes fell on the multitudes and he saw him as a sheep without a shepherd what did he do taught them that's what a shepherd does that's what a shepherd does he leads by teaching. This is according to the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. I will give you pastors according to mine heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's what a pastor is. That's what a shepherd is. A shepherd is someone who dispenses knowledge and understanding. You know when Christ, Christ's primary appeal to men is to their understanding. It's to their understanding. There are other kinds of appeals. Sometimes when preachers appeal they like make a major appeal to instruction that's like the main thing okay this, this isn't how God brings you to heaven go down 
to Church Street and take a left on Second. Go down to this. But some people preach like that's the way. That's the way. There is instruction in the Bible, but that's not the. You can follow instruction without having understanding. I'm sure you know that. I'm just like a robot. You just kind of go through the rote. But see, it's in divine illumination when you understand what Jesus is talking about that you're led. Amen. You're led. Amen. Huh? Because there's light in understanding. Yeah. That shine. In thy light we see light. See light. What, did, what did David say? Thy word yeah. is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, it's, he's a teacher. See, and he's not just teaching instruction, and he's not just appealing to your emotions. Jesus is not chiefly an emotionalist. I, I'm kind of an emotional person, so I understand this. But emotions have to be sanctified by understanding. If you ever get emotion out before understanding, more than likely you'll tend to despise understanding. And there's a lot of music like this. That's why I used to tell young people, when you think a song is so great, cut the music and just listen to the lyrics, and then tell me if it's so great. Because you can get all caught up in emotion. That's like a soulish thing. But when Jesus comes to you, he will chiefly appeal to your understanding. Mm -hmm. Hear and understand, Jesus would say. Often say things like that. Hear and understand, he would say. He said this one time to his disciples after he had taught this extensive revelation of the, of, the, of the sowing of the wheat and tares. He said, now have you understood all these things? I think that's a good thing to say after we get done preaching. To say, now have you understood all these things? Maybe you'll sit there and you'll hear Jesus actually say that to you. You can sense he's like saying that to your heart. Now, a lot of truth's been given tonight. A lot of truth's been given all day long. Now have you understood all these things? He appeals to your understanding because that's how he leads his sheep is through understanding. Another time he told his disciples, do you not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves? Remembrance is very important. Some of the brethren here, they write down the notes. Why do they do that? Because they want to remember what was said. Mm -hmm. Jesus expects you to remember what he's taught you. Amen. Because sometimes for you to learn the second thing, you got to already have the first thing in your mind. What does he mean? It's because we didn't bring bread. Not good. Not when Jesus appeals to your understanding. It's important that you get what he said before. He expects for you to do this. Why? Because you're sheep and you hear his voice. He should expect it. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher. And he leads us by his understanding. Jesus is the custodian of truth. Jesus can give understanding. He can give it. He can give understanding. What is understanding? It's the clarification of truth. That's what understanding is. Jesus can clarify the truth. You remember those two on the road to Emmaus? We've mentioned this here recently. They're on the road. They're on the road. And I love the way the scriptures, I love the way the scriptures open up this, this marvelous event with the Son of God. It says that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus drew near. Why? Because it's about understanding. You know, if a man is not engaged in his mind, why, why, brethren? Why, brethren, is the exhortation, gird up the loins of your mind, so important? Because Jesus is conveying understanding, and Jesus is quite frustrated when the people's minds aren't engaged. It's a frustration. Because that's what he's doing. He's giving understanding. And while they reasoned and they were communing, in other words, they were talking back and forth about these things, Jesus drew near. And you know how Jesus is as a good shepherd. He taught them. Before that meeting of them was over, he had taught them, and they said, Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures? He expounded the scriptures unto us. Jesus is a teaching shepherd. Why is teaching so important? Okay, let me say this. Why is teaching so important? For this reason, because it is the basis of our fellowship with Christ. It's a fellowship of understanding. If the people are really fundamentally ignorant of Jesus, do you realize, and I know you do, so I'm not insulting your intelligence here. At, at best, they have a very limited fellowship with Christ, and at worst, they are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. That's a serious matter. Ignorance is a serious matter because it's, it's a blockade to fellowship with Christ. 
The Son of God has come and has given us an understanding in order that we might know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son. And then he says, and this is the true God and eternal life. This is what it is. This is what it is. Because it's a fellowship of understanding. The more that you understand about God and about Christ and about salvation, the more fellowship you have with God. And so think of that. That's a marvelous way of coming into the assembly with a great anticipation of understanding. Because if your understanding is increased in the assembly, your fellowship with Christ is increased. Mm -hmm. That's what eternal life is. I mean, that's what he's giving us. I, I know you know that connection. The second thing is because spiritual understanding is a prerequisite to following Christ. Jesus directs us through illumination and understanding. Okay? If a person doesn't really understand Christ, he will not be able to follow him. He will not be able to do this. And life will be one confusing thing after another. Truth is like an interpreter of life. It helps you to see what's going on, and particularly to be able to see the hand of God working so that you can call him, fall in line with it. If you don't understand, you can't follow. You can't. This is exactly why God, when he, was, when he was exhorting his people, he would say some things like this. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto, me, unto thee. Why did Israel buck and kick against God? Because he, they didn't understand him. That's the only reason they did that. It's because they didn't understand that great shepherd of Israel. That's why they bucked. And that's why people buck today. If you see people and they really are genuinely bucking, it's because they don't understand what God is doing. And so you've got to put a bit in their mouth and tell them, now you better do this and you've got to do this and God says do this and, and do that and do this while you're at it. And now this is not the preferred way of trying to lead people. I suppose for a time God will do something like that. Maybe he'll do something like that, put a bit in the bridle in someone's mouth to try and help them. But you've got to get out of the horse stage. You've got to get out of the horse stage. That is not a good tribute to what salvation is about. In salvation, so to speak, we go from being horse to being sheep. And sheep, you don't put a bit in the bridle and mouth of sheep. If you do that, it'll drop to the ground and go nowhere. That's just how sheep are. You can't drive a sheep like that. A sheep follows by listening. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Now, this is the last thing, because I'm running out of time. I know them. Jesus is a personal shepherd. I know them. It's not that he knows them academically. It's that he knows them experientially. I mean, you can know someone academically. I, mean, I, know, I know about Abraham Lincoln out of a textbook, but I don't know Abraham Lincoln. And if someone else knew Abraham Lincoln, they listened to me talking about Abraham Lincoln, it would be very obvious that I don't know him. That's not the kind of know that Jesus has. That's, that's not at all it. I know them. It's like a term of experience and abiding familiarity. He knows them. He knows them. Whenever, in Song of Solomon, you remember in the opening of that first chapter, the lover cannot... The, she cannot find her lover. And so she wants to find it, looking for where her lover is, didn't know where he was. And she said, tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest. Have you ever said that to the Lord? Tell me where you're feeding. I want to know, know where you are. I want to know where you are. I want to be where you are. If you love Jesus, you do want to be where he is. But here was the advice given in verse 8. If thou knowest not, you don't know where he's at. Okay, so you can't just go to where he's at. If thou knowest not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock. That's right. That's right. Why? Because your lover is a shepherd. And the shepherd is always with the sheep. You know, when I come here to the assembly... Sometimes I've been in a time where God's like hidden himself. But if I get behind Sister Nikki's truck, because I know she's a sheep, and I follow her here, those are like footsteps. And I'm following her footsteps. You know why? Because I know when I get to the assembly where the sheep are, I'm going to find Jesus. I know life isn't always like that, but sometimes it is, and I want to encourage you with that. If God has hidden himself from you, if you'll get into the assembly, Jesus will reveal himself to you. 
because that's where he is. See, this assembly is like all these footsteps leading up. It's like the footsteps of sheep leading up into this place. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, that's where he is. He's here. He's in the assembly. Why? Because he's a shepherd and because he knows his sheep. Whenever John the Revelator got his, this marvelous vision, you remember one of the first things he saw was the glorified Christ. He's lifted up. But do you remember where he was? He was walking in the midst of the candlesticks. He was right in the midst of his church. You know, the disciples were burdened. They were burdened because Jesus said he was going to go away. And so this burdened their heart. Rightfully so, it should burden their heart because they didn't have an understanding of what was happening here. But then he said to them, he said these words. He says, but I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. And he said, in that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father and you in me and I in you. Now, do you know that today? Do you know that? Do you know that Jesus is in the Father? Do you know this? How do you know something like that? Because he knows you. And because he is with you. I will not leave you. One of the other translations says, I will not leave you as orphans. Mm -hmm. When men have natural affections, they don't just have their babies and then discard them, do they? Well, Jesus doesn't do this either. He doesn't discard his people. He's with them. Yeah. He cleaves to them like a husband does to his wife. He cleaves to them. He is with them. You remember when he's, this great commission, you know, we've heard this great commission, this great commission, but brother, this isn't all bad. There, there's good things in here. I know that men have exploited this, but now he tells them to teach and to baptize and these things. But then he says, he says like one of the most important things. And lo, that is pay attention to this, brethren, because if you're going to be comforted and working for the Lord, you're going to have to be thinking more about the Lord than you do about you. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Has the age ended? He's with us. That's how I reason. He's with us. That's what he said he would do. See, he knows his sheep. He's with them. Now, I love this. This is a great thing to see. He's with them, which means he knows them, he knows them all. He knows them all. He knows them corporately, and he knows them individually. He knows them, okay? Very personally, he knows them. I like the wor this word in the scriptures. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Sorry, brother. Hold on just a second. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Now listen to this, because this is marvelous. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. And shall gently lead those that are with young. Jesus knows in our assembly who's a lamb and who's a sheep. He knows this. He knows who's young and who's older. You remember when, when Esau, when, when uh, Jacob finally had that, that confrontation with Esau and things went well? And Esau said, you just go with me. Well, Esau wasn't much of a shepherd. Remember, he wasn't a shepherd. And so Jacob was, was afraid because Jacob was a shepherd and knew his flock. He was afraid if, if Esau went out and led, he would drive the sheep too hard and it'd kill all the flock because Jacob appealed to him and said, because there are young in the flock. And if you drive them, you'll kill them. Now, I would like to have a better ability in this regard. You know, and all under shepherds, they want to have a better ability in this regard, to be able to distinguish the sheep, to know who's lamb and who's a sheep. Yeah. Because if you are not careful, you will drive the lamb too hard. But I will tell you this, Jesus never drives the lamb too hard. And he never underdrives the sheep. I get the sense that he's like driving us now more. He's like driving us, or compelling would be a better word. I know he's not behind us pushing us, things like that. He, that's not how a shepherd leads sheep. He's out in front of them. But he knows us individually. Now, I'm not, I'm not for the whole personal gospel thing as people talk about it, and I'm not here to try and make us selfish. I'm just trying to encourage us that Jesus knows us all. In fact, the scripture says in John 10 that he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. That's a very important piece of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Haven't you not known so there are certain times in your life where you've kind of been more like a lamb than you have a sheep, mm -hmm. where you couldn't walk? 
and you kind of sensed that you were being put on, put into his arms or maybe put onto his shoulder. That, that picture this morning, Brother Bob, that was really good. You've had times like this. But if Jesus had not known that, you'd have perished. See, in, in a sense, we are, we are a very fragile kind of people. We are not autonomous, has been said here multiple times. We are very dependent on the shepherd. And it's good to know that this shepherd is with us and he knows us. Okay? That he can appropriately minister. You've not been overcome, have you? You've not been overcome along the way. Why? Because he knows his sheep. Yeah. That's why. And so I, I just want to encourage you with these things, brother. And this, this, is, this is a marvelous truth. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is a marvelous truth of this great salvation of God. We were all alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that was in us. But now he's working salvation and he's giving eternal life. And what is he giving? He's giving a sheep that know his voice, that, that hear his voice, and he knows them. And as they are in this fellowship together, in the context of that fellowship where understanding is being dispensed and we're receiving and giving, he's giving eternal life. That's what he's doing. You don't have the whole of eternal life yet. But if you will let his staff comfort you and you will stay near him, sometimes he's going to lead you through some rough things. These are things that I want to get to later on. And other times he'll lead you, he'll lead you by still waters and through green grass. But now if he's with you or more, more, if you are with him, you're going to get the fullness of eternal life. That's his commitment. That's why God sent him into the world. He is the bread of life, has come down to the world and gives life to the world. It isn't just the conception of life, it's the fullness of life. Amen. And what is that fullness? That one day you'll be able to stand in the presence of the divine glory and look upon the God whom you have served and loved and not perish. That's going to be a glad day. But more Amen. than that, that you're going to rejoice in his presence. Mm -hmm. Aren't you already kind of rejoicing in his presence now? Amen. And it's telling you that the work is shaping up. But now here's the ability of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to see to it that you not only not fall, but you stand before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you'll know the fullness of eternal life. But it's because the shepherd has been leading you all the way. Amen. Thank God for the shepherd. Thank you, brother. Amen.